Hello and welcome to the world today. With me in the studio is Arundhati Roy, who has written books, many books, but two new books. One is her lengthy and very powerful introduction, The Doctor and the Saint, to a classic of Indian political literature, The Annihilation of Caste, by B. R. Ambedkar, one of the great leaders of the Indian independence movement, sadly ignored by the mainstream and hardly known in different parts of the world. The second book accompanying it is a collection of essays, Capitalism, A Ghost Story, which contains some of her writings on different aspects of life in India, uh, political life in India and elsewhere. Arunathi, welcome. Thank you. <coughs> Let's start, I mean, there's so much in your books, we'll weave in and out of them as we go along. But let's start with India today. Not a pleasant thing, I know. But the overwhelming triumph of the BJP has to be explained somehow. Not simply in terms of the other parties, the Congress in particular being a, you know, unable to do anything for the people, but something which one feels is changing in India itself. So how would you explain the, the, the scale of the victory? Sometimes the scale, of course, is made out to be more than it is ah. because of the, 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 math the mathematics involved in this electoral system. But still, we can't minimize you know, the extent of it. It's been a long time since a party, a single party has won a majority on its own and doesn't need coalition partners. I think uh, there are a few things, you know, one is, one is that this kind of Hindu uh, right-wing um, uh, bid for power is, is, has been happening since the 1920s, you know, so it's, it's got a great historical impetus behind it. I, you know, why it happened now, of course, there are a whole lot of reasons. One of them is that it was literally an election without an opposition. What had happened with the Congress is that uh, because, perhaps because of dynastic rule and this immutable system of the Nehru Gandhi family uh, being an unquestioned and undisputed leadership of the party, they had in fact created a system where, where, where in order not to feel threatened themselves, inside the party they had, they had sort of weeded out any, any kind of powerful or real political figure. So you ended up with a party where nobody, not the Prime Minister, not Sonia Gandhi, not Rahul Gandhi, not anybody had the power to really just go out and talk to the people mm. and they had just weeded all that out and turned it into this technocratic regime of elites you know so in a way i mean the the only good thing i suppose is that those elites have really been put out to farm you know the old elites the dangerous thing is that this idea that you know, this new government has brought up a man of the people and all of that is now uh, as big a, a, a falsehood, you know, because it is really about a new kind of elite now. And I think, um, you know, it's difficult to explain to audiences outside who don't know the intricacies of caste, but if you were to observe the debates in India just before a run up to the election, the only thing you'll talk about almost is caste. I mean, the rhetoric of development and so on is one thing, but actually the intricate calculations are all about which caste will move from here to there in Bihar. Will the, you know, Yadavs move to this side or will they move to that side? Where will the Jat vote go and all of that? And in that, Modi positioned himself as what in shorthand in India is called the OBC, which is the other backward caste, Gosh. right? Which is the huge uh, numbers of people who actually shifted. And, uh, and he, Modi, I mean, most people will tell you that Modi is actually a banya, like a trader caste, like Gandhi's caste, you know? But 
you know, in, in terms of what is a scheduled caste and what is a backward caste, like people on the margins can move this way and that. And so I think, uh, you know, while he was chief minister of Gujarat, he, he made the Modis a backward caste. And then he was portrayed as this backward caste, you know, man of the people, actually. While, in fact, the, the, the real stuff is all about supporting corporate power, inviting inviting in uh, f uh, international investment, uh, undoing uh, labor protection, and m m you know pushing forward more of the same, which Manmohan Singh started as the finance minister when he was um, first uh, finance minister in the 90s. And of course, let's not, let's not forget the fact that this whole idea of, you know, after the Mughals came the British and now finally the Hindus, the are. Hindus after so many <coughs> hundreds of years are back in power. You know, so there are many layers on which this operates. What you've described could be said about now, could be said about all the major capitalist countries in the world. Yes. I mean, I've described these parties um, as the extreme center. So it yes. doesn't really matter, except on certain cultural issues, whether it's party A or party B or party C in power, or whether they're in coalition together, they basically do the same things. They're in hock to the corporations. They don't care a damn about the poor. They allow global capitalism to trample them. And what we are now seeing, which many people had not realized that this is happening in India as well, and that there's no special distinction between what Congress's economic policies were and what the new government is going to do. In terms of policy, that's true. In terms of implementation, I'd say there's something uh, slightly more frightening, you know, because of course, uh, you know, I've written a lot about it, but in, in uh, uh, 2011, I think it was when the Congress came out and declared this thing called Operation Green Hunt, where they deployed hundreds of thousands of paramilitary in the central forests of central India uh, against the poorest people in the world, if you like, the indigenous people who had, uh, you know, organized themselves, parts, uh, many of them had organized themselves deep in the forest under, you know, a kind of Maoist uh, banner of the Maoist movement. But basically, it, it was a battle where uh, the government had signed over all this land, the rivers, the mountains, to big international and national corporations, mining and infrastructure corporations. And they were basically, try, and they'd even raised the Adivasi, a tribal vigilante army. And the idea was to, to, to create so much terror that people would just leave the forests, you mm. know? And uh, of course, there was a great resistance, not just from inside the forest, that was the military resistance, the armed resistance, but there were a lot of people outside as well who, who, who stood up to this and, and then the announcement was sort of withdrawn, but the war was not. But now, see, because the corporations in India, they own the media, like a corporation like Reliance owns 27, uh, 24 hour news channels in so many languages. Newspapers, uh, you know, co corporations that own newspapers also own the mining companies. And, and and they, I mean, th that's a separate subject, I guess we'll talk about it, but like what's happening in India right now is that it's not that the government is going after the Muslim community, you know, Modi himself might appear to be statesmanlike. I mean, it's not that, the thing is that they're, they're not intervening when mobs are set are let loose on on people you know in in a place like muzaffarnagar in up now you have thousands of people living in relief camps having left their land which is now up for grabs you know outside delhi and bhavana and trilokpuri everywhere there's this there's this kind of um, uh, street justice that's happening only one way of course and most of the time and it's um, it's building up to a, a, a very, very dangerous situation. Of course, all these things happened also under the Congress. Mm. You know, of course, Sikhs were massacred on the streets 
1984 when Indira Gandhi very, was killed. Yeah, yeah. You know, so one can't uh, pretend that oh, you know, this party did this, and that. they both have these mm, genocidal massacres. But I'm talking about the historical trajectory of this. You know, it's not as though there's a long-standing historical tra uh, trajectory against the Sikhs or the desire to murder them, you know. Whereas from 1925, when the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which Modi belongs to and many of his ministers belong to, since then, there has been this build up in, you know, in the 30s, um, they were saying that uh, Muslims uh, of India are the Jews of Germany. And so, you know, the, the massacre of people on the streets of Gujarat, the Muslim community or Muzaffar Nagar, it's not that it was more or less cruel than what happened when the Congress did it. It's just that it has a very planned history of, of, of many years, you know, 75, 85 years. And, and, and they've been planning this. The RSS has, uh, has hundreds of thousands of volunteers, hundreds of thousands of branches. It's very systematic. The takeover is very systematic, you know? Mm. Uh, so, so Just explain for viewers, what is the difference between the RSS and mm. the BJP? The BJP is a political party. The RSS is a kind of cultural guild. In, it was set up in, uh, in 1925. Uh, you know, in the, in, the 19, in the early 1920s, when Gandhi had uh, you know, just come back from South Africa, uh, the first non-cooperation movement against the British also was uh, what was also part of it was known as the Khilafat movement, which was the which which was uh, you know against the fall of the uh, the, the, the caliphate the caliphate the Congress uh, led by I mean in a way led by Gandhi but there was Tilak and Gokhale and they were all Brahmins and mm -hmm. Banias and the Khilafat movement by conservative Muslims and Gandhi. Uh, kind of joined the two and the Congress at that point was trying to c trying to position itself as the representative of everybody of Sikhs, Hindus, uh, Muslims, everybody you know untouchable castes and the more it tried to pull together the more it blew apart and this uh, it, and by 1925 of course, you. I mean, eventually Jinnah left uh, the, the Congress. Congress, and the conservative uh, Hindu right formed the the, the RSS. RSS, which is the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's a it's a nationalist Hindu so, uh, party, and it the self help group, as it's called, and it just became more and more. Uh, I mean. When you call it fascist, it's they themselves who have Hitler and Mussolini and people like that in their uh, pantheon. You know, so it's not a, a bad word for them. It's a yeah. good word. It's they not an insult. It. They, they, yeah, so it's not uh, a, a bad thing. And now, you know, and, and they, is, is, is a, when I say it's a cultural guild, they have these shakhas about branches uh, all over the country. They have worked very hard you can you know you'll have to compliment them for that the left <laughs> didn't have any such thing you know so they have worked very hard sometimes underground for several years but today they have you know women's wings education wing youth wing slum dwellers wings publishing wings they they, they are they are in the business of rewriting textbooks so you know in that way it's a little facile to say everything is the same because there's a systematic rewriting oh. of history, of, of working, and they have worked from the grassroots levels upwards, you know, so it's, it's got very deep roots, what is going on now. So basically, uh, Modi, as a member of the RSS, <coughs> is the one who unites the BJP and the RSS. Yes, I mean the, B country. the BJP uh, is in some ways the political Arm wing of the, of of the, the, of RSS. the RSS. We can but say that now. Yes, yeah. but certainly, but certainly, you know, but Vajpayee was also a member, member of, the of the RSS. You know, Advani was a member of the RSS, 
And I think now most of the ministers ah. are, you know. And the, what I was told by some Indian friends is that the, amongst the more vicious things they're doing is that they have a concerted plan to really dominate Indian political culture, Indian historical culture by, as you would said, rewriting everything and making sure that their people are in important places in the universities, in the media networks, yeah. etc. Media so networks, that it becomes difficult. Police, intelligence, judiciary, all, all of that. I mean, that was already that was already the case mm. even when the Congress was in power. You know, because the idea that you can actually impose this kind of single point agenda on such a diverse nation. Mm is is i think uh, what is going to be frightening you know at some point it's not going to be possible because as we know you know the the diversity of uh, communities in india is so huge and the other main uh, agenda now is that see at the turn of the century between the <coughs> 19th and 20th century when the whole idea of empire turned into the idea of a nation state, you know, yeah. when it just didn't, it wasn't a question of riding a horse into Delhi and saying I'm now the emperor or I'm the, you know, British uh, empire. Then the politics of representation became extremely important, you know, yeah. it, it became a debate. And the British, of course, who, who, who gave themselves the power of uh, ruling over people with the imperial mandate started asking these very mischievous questions for mischievous reasons, you know, to the Congress. How can you, upper caste, privileged caste Hindus, claim to represent the Muslims and the untouchable community and so on? That time, the untouchable community was about 45 million people. And until that time, Millions had converted to Sikhism, to, uh, of course, later to Sikhism, earlier to Buddhism. Islam, to Buddhism, and to um, Christianity to escape the scourge of caste. But nobody minded, right? But when the politics of representation became important, the politics of demography became important, then it became very, very important to prevent this conversion. And that was when these great Hindu reformist organizations rose, like the Arya Samaj, the, uh, <coughs> the Ramakrishna Mission. And they started this thing called the Shuddhi movement, which is outrageous name. It was like about purifying the impure and bringing them into the Hindu fold, keeping them as untouchables, but under the accounting head of Hindu, right? If you read the papers today, they're actually talking about how we need a new Shuddhi movement and how to uh, basically bring this huge community of Dalits back into the Hindu fold. I mean, they are in the Hindu fold, the Sanskritization and Hinduiz Hinduization is happening. But, you know, someone like Ambedkar challenged that and told them they should convert to Buddhism and so on. But now, how do you use them as the outlying army against the Muslims? Mm. You know, so the, this this attempt to create clashes between Dalits and Muslims. I mean, as usual, you know, div divide the people you're oppressing, uh, a, 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 and you know, uh, smoke up the mirrors. But that's happening. But let's now, we are at this point. Just describe what it is about the Indian caste system that is so specific in Indian politics today. Because often if you read political commentators, Western correspondents writing, it's as if caste doesn't exist at all. Mm. And as you point out in your book, it's been too easy for the left to say caste is just another form of class and merge the two together, mm. thus destroying any idea of its specificity. And also destroying their relevance in India. Yeah. You know? So um, basically, I think the difference between, I mean, obviously, Ambedkar writes extensively about the difference between race and caste. You know, caste is not race, no. but casteism and racism 
are similar in that they discriminate against people because of their descent. You know, that, that is there. But caste, it's like um, the, the issue is social, but it's also institutionalized and uh, valorized by religious texts. Right? So caste, uh, if I can simplify it, the, 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 what Ambedkar called the mother of the caste system is known as the Varnashram Dharma, where there are these four major Varnas, the Brahmins, who the are... The Brahmins priests. are the top. Yeah, the Brahmins are pure. You see, it's not just a division of, I mean, basically caste is about hereditary occupation yeah. and therefore about entitlement, hmm. but it's also about pollution and purity, mm. okay, according to the Hindu practice <coughs> and Hindu texts. So the Brahmin is is the purest, the priest. Then there's the sh uh, then there's the sh uh, Kshatriya, the warrior. There's the Banya or the, the uh, Vaishya, who's the trader. And there's the Shudra, who's the service provider. And then at the bottom outside of the caste system are the Ati Shudras, who are the untouchables. Touchable. And amongst them, again, there are untouchables and unapproachables and unseeables. And so this, these major divisions now are subdivided into something like 4,000 what are called jatis, that are little endogamous castes. Each has its own hereditary occupation. So that is... Uh, Essentially, I mean, the ordinary person's guide, if you like, to, to caste. And, uh, you know, people think that, uh, you know, because of this new kind of liberalization and new infusion of capital and it globalizations, that it has, that new networks have arisen. But this is actually completely false because, uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just say, say this in a few minutes, but first of all, surveys are showing now that less than 5% of marriages in India are outside caste, right? Less than 5%. And, and if you read the papers, amongst those 5%, you read about beheadings and lynchings of people who have dared to marry outside, outside, their outside, caste. Of, outside of their caste. Of course, you know, the elite they like to say that they don't practice caste, they don't have to because there are no, they don't encounter it in some ways. But of course they do in their homes and everybody does practice it in some way or the other. But I'm saying <clears throat> that, okay, so that's about the inter-caste marriage. But if you look at the new economy, as we know, um, you know, it's created a situation where wealth is concentrated in fewer and fewer hands and you have, basically the economy in India controlled by a handful of corporations. Here you're talking about a cross ownership where you'll have, uh, you know, a company like Reliance, for example, which, which runs, you know, petrochemicals, electricity distribution, ports, special economic zones, universities, textiles, um, I mean, internet, and of course, as I said earlier, 27, you know, 24 hour news channels. You, so so they, they have this kind of cross ownership and therefore really the power to sh almost shut the country down if mm. they would like to. But if you look at who are these major corporations who, for example, 100 people own the, the, the same um, amount of wealth as 25% of the GDP, but who are they? You know, who are these big corporations? Who run the small businesses? Who are the businessmen on the ground who have, you know, who, who give loans to Adivasis and small farmers and labor who, the whole of l rural India is caught in debt. It's in a huge debt trap. So who are those people? And you see that whether it's Reliance or the Mittals or the Jindals, all of them are Banias, hmm. you know, which is the trading caste. So you have, and they are like 2% of the population that controls the Indian economy, mm. you know. So as I was saying, as caste and capitalism have become such a potent alloy, these, these corporations own the media. If you look at the big media, I mean, Times of India, Hindustan Times, Indian Express, Dainik Jagran, Dainik Bhaskar, 
ZT, we, all of them are Bania owned, you know. So there, that's really interesting that, that, that this new economy has actually entrenched and modernized caste in a way. And then if you look at, at let's say the Dalit population, look at a state like Punjab, which is supposed to be the, the, the richest state in many ways, the agricultural miracle. You have uh, a huge Dalit population. You even have, of course, as you know, in India, Muslims and Sikhs and Christians practice caste. So Punjab has a, a high Dalit population, 40%, 90% of them are landless. If you look at the debates on caste in India, where there's a kind of, um, what is all the oxygen taken up by? The, the idea of reservation or what in America they call affirmative action. And there are huge debates and people have immolated themselves because they say that everything, you know, reservation is wrong and that they should be, everything should be on the basis of merit and <clears throat> uh, you know, I've quoted some progressive pro professors saying that, you know, uh, we'll really lose our international standing if we allow uh, Dalits to come in and, you know, whether you look at reservation in the judiciary or in the academia, wherever you look at it. Firstly, the quotas are not filled, you know, of reservation. Secondly, reservation only applies to 2% of the Dalit population because that's the percentage that actually has the educational qualifications. Mm -hmm. So, the, but the entire debate on caste is taken up by that. And the only place where it's more than the quota, if you like, are the municipal sweepers, which are 90% of Dalit, course. you know. Mm -hmm. You have more than a million people who still own their living by manual scavenging, you know. So, Caste is so very much there, and yet, I mean, obviously, progressive intellectuals have just somehow invisibilized it, you know, mostly because the left has not been able to address it or deal with it. Nowhere. And <coughs> Ambedkar, Ambedkar had a huge falling out with Dange, who was one of the big, Com big, uh, communist, party uh, big communist party leader over a mill worker strike in the li in late 1920s, where even in the mill, amongst the mill workers, you know, the, the Dalits were only allowed to work in the lower paid spinning department because in the weaving department, they had to hold the thread in their mouths and that was considered to be pollution. Pol pollution. So he said, look, at least we should first talk about the equality between laborers, workers, and that was sort of not countenanced. And so he says in, 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 in Annihilation of Caste that caste is not just a division of labor, but a division of laborers, you know. And, and, and uh, he fell out with them, and it was a terrible falling out, you know, uh, c which continues to, to this day. And I, I believe that that rift, you know, which unless it's, unless it's theoretically and politically and you know, addressed on the ground, both damage each other yeah. very, very seriously, you know. So when the, let's say the CPM, the Communist Party of India, Marxist, was in power for 30 years mm. in a populist state like West Bengal, mm. this is one question, that, oh, one amongst many, but this question was not addressed at all. It wasn't addressed. I mean, it was it was just invisibilized. And if you go to West Bengal, you know, you'll see that it exists. It's not as if it's gone. And and as I as I've said, you know, many of the senior leaders of all the communist parties are, are Brahmin. You know, of course, uh, my novel, The God of Small Things, is about that. It's it about is, yeah. it's about how the communist party, be, you know, couldn't. And, uh, and was as casteist as anybody else. And they were very, very angry with it. Very, very angry, you know? No, I remember. I yeah. remember there were quite a few reviews yeah. which disliked the novel because you yeah. had put in these yeah. criticisms. Of and it. it's just like, you have to just say, caste is class, comrade, and that's the end of it. But sorry, it's not, you know? <laughs>